So today's presentation is going to be called the Medical, Medical Magic 8 Ball, which is identifying essential factors for your application's success. My name is Abigail Jones, and I'm a Liberty University graduate with a Bachelor's of Science in Biomedical Sciences, and I'm an incoming NS1 at the University of South Carolina in the School of Medicine of Greenville. So they are recording this seminar. I didn't know if we would be, but we are, so that way... If you guys want to watch it back or if other people who weren't able to make it want to watch it back, that'll be available to you. Um, at the end, I will advertise some packages in case you find yourself needing some additional help um, aside from these free seminars that Accepted Together offers. So you can reach out to Accepted Together. Um, they're very responsive. Um, you also can find me on their website if you'd like to send me a message through their website. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm from West Virginia, but I have lived in Virginia for college, and now I live in South Carolina as an emergency room technician. I like to do oil and acrylic painting in my free time. I do a lot of cross training, so lifting weights, um, cycling a lot, those types of things are very fun to me. Any type of outdoor hiking, I like going to the beach. Um, currently, I'm in the thick of planning my wedding to my high school sweetheart, that's why I have blurred my background here so that all of my wedding decorations won't be very distracting to you guys. So let's go ahead and get started. Why do I call this the medical magic eight ball? I call it that because these are the eight aspects of your application that I believe are critical to evaluate before you press the submit button. So there's a couple of things here that we're going to talk about that are going to help you gain insight into your future application success. So I'll go ahead and just run through this eight list of things, and then we'll kind of touch on those things in more detail as we go along. I'm going to try to keep this relatively short, 20 to 25 minutes. That way you guys have plenty of time for questions. I also don't want to bore you all with all this stuff. Um, I know that you need to know it, but I don't want to be boring either. So first, we're going to talk about prerequisite coursework. That's the first thing that you have to think about when you're considering applying. Then we'll move on to activities, the MCAT, letters of recommendation your personal statement, experience essays, and organizing your finances. And finally, the most important thing when applying for medical school is stamina. So here I have, I have 90%, ignore that. I don't know why I wrote that. Um, you need to have 90 credit hours of prerequisite coursework completed at the time that you apply. This is 90 credit hours toward whatever bachelor's of science or bachelor's of arts degree that you are working toward at an accredited university. You have to have a bachelor's degree of some kind. It doesn't have to be science related, but you do need to go ahead and start working on those prerequisite courses if you do have a different major, like a music major or something. So this includes a year of biology, chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, math, and labs for all of those sciences. Um, keep in mind, organic chemistry, some schools are starting to do one semester of it, but despite that, I would still go ahead and get that one year done because um, it's going to be 50-50 split, so you might as well just take them both. Then you need a semester of biochemistry, psychology, and genetics with a lab. Some schools may require calculus. A couple of the ones that I applied to did, so I went ahead and took that as one of my math credits. And this is where we come to my very first big tip. Um, if you didn't already know that this existed, MSAR is the best thing that you will spend $25 on during this entire time. MSAR is... Um, it includes school-specific required coursework, so it'll have, you know, regular double AMC requirements, but it'll also have maybe a specific social studies course that your dream school requires. If your dream school requires that course, go ahead and add it. Make sure that you intend to complete that at the time that you graduate, so when you send your transcripts in, they don't tell you that you are not eligible for interviews. The MSAR has a lot of other great stuff that we'll touch on in a little bit, but I have the link posted right there. Um, you can copy and paste that into your browser later on if you're interested in looking at that, but you pay $25 and you get it for the entire year. So I think that's very helpful. You can't talk about coursework without talking about your GPA. Um, I know that sometimes numbers give a lot of people anxiety, but I'm not talking about this to give you anxiety. I'm just trying to keep in mind that uh, reflecting on your GPA and identifying it as either a weakness in your application or a strength is gonna be very important. So whether you're a sophomore, a junior, a senior on this platform, and you're thinking about applying, you need to evaluate where you currently stand academically. And if there's anything that you should be doing to improve that, whether that's a post-bac program, 
Were you taking a course, et cetera? So we'll talk a little bit of statistics. Minimum GPA to apply to medical school is a 3.0, whether you're applying MD, DO, or TMDAS. I will have a disclaimer here that I don't have any experience applying to Texas medical schools. Um, so if you didn't know, there's the DO platform, the MD platform, and the Texas medical school platform. They have their own platform because 90% of their students are from Texas. Um, so I did not personally have that experience. So these GPAs are just for US MD and DO. So the average accepted science GPA is a 3.71 for MD schools and a 3.35 for DO schools. The average accepted cumulative GPA is a 3.77 and for DO it is a 3.46. So while these are averages, you know, accepted students, students that matriculate to medical school, they come in a range. There's gonna be students on the low end of this and on the high end of this, and you can be either. You don't need to stress about it if your GPA is not the exact GPA that the average is for the school that you wanna to apply to. If it's a little bit lower, just apply. It'll be fine, I promise. So no, this is something important to keep in mind because if you fall on the lower end of this, you might need to think about how that affects the school list that you start creating as you're thinking about applying, which schools that you think you have a great chance of getting accepted to and maybe a little bit less of a chance of getting accepted to. This also will inform you about how you need to approach your MCAT. Do you need to set aside a more extensive amount of time studying for it so that you can absolutely crush the MCAT and get a super high score to kind of balance out a lower GPA? That's just something that you need to assess about your application is how do these academic standings look next to each other, these statistics? You are more than just this number. They're looking at your whole application, but I just want you to remember to reflect on that. Next portion is the activities. So I have up here to do as I say, not as I do, because I wanna make a small point that if you're a freshman or a sophomore, you need to go ahead and keep a log of your activities. I was told to do this and I did not do this and I regretted it because when I came time to do my application, I was sitting there and I was having a hard time remembering stories that were exemplary of the kind of activities that I had done with volunteering or clinical. So I say this to make sure that if you are at a point where you can try to start making a log of your volunteer work or your job and write down little stories that give good examples as to why that was important to you. And that will be immensely helpful to you when you get to your application and start writing a bunch of essays. So these are the questions that you need to start asking yourself. And you need to start asking yourself these questions as you get into your freshman year, you know, let yourself have that first semester to get get on your feet and get your feet wet with academics and then start asking yourself, what kind of clinical experience do I need? Volunteer experience, research experience, job or life experience. What are my hobbies? Do I have hobbies? Do I need to get hobbies? These are questions that you need to start thinking about and things that you need to keep a record of to make your life easier when it comes to applying to medical school. Now, again, at the bottom here in bold, I'd like you to Remember this when you walk away from today's seminar. If you have to choose between clinical research experience, please choose clinical unless you are applying to MD, PhD schools because your job as a physician is the clinical setting. You are working with patients. So you need to show that you have spent meaningful time with patients and that those experiences have continued to lead you down the path to medicine. If you are primarily interested in research, that's okay, still do research, do lots of research, but please make sure you have some meaningful clinical experience to put on your application. So I wanna talk briefly about the MCAT. I don't wanna talk about it for too long um, because it's sort of a whole other seminar in and of itself. This test is a beast. Please don't let it overwhelm you. It can be very stressful. Um, don't let it overwhelm you to an extent that you feel like you can't do it because it's not impossible. It's just difficult. Do give it the respect it deserves. I would um, say that the minimum study time is three months for a person who has done very well in prerequisite coursework and has had tutoring experience. And for most pre-medical students, I would say five to eight months is sufficient. Some people will study for an entire year uh, if they feel that they really need some extra time to go back and learn some of those freshman concepts that are very old to you now. 
So the next thing that you need to think about when thinking about, you know, when do I want to start studying for the MCAT is you need to decide if you're going to self-study or if you're going to pay for some sort of tutoring service. Some universities have tutoring services for a very low fee or included in tuition. Mine did not. Um, some, some people will just uh, borrow books from people and they'll self-study that way. Um, you do need to do more than just practice questions. The first time that I took the MCAT, I only did practice questions and that did not serve me well. The second time I trained, changed my strategy entirely. I studied for five months instead of two and I opened books that allowed me to review concepts that I forgot about because your coursework as an undergrad is not sufficient to prepare you for the MCAT. The MCAT requires strategy as well as reviewing those concepts that you forgot even existed because you've been in the thick of organic chemistry or physiology and you forgot about, you know, regular concepts from gen bio. Next thing that I have here at the bottom is that timing is everything. Take the MCAT when you're ready to take the MCAT. If you're not scoring your goal score or even close to your goal score, you can reschedule the test. Now you have to keep in mind that rescheduling a test does require a fee. It's not a huge fee, but it is a fee. So the later that you wait to reschedule it, the larger the fee gets. But if you have to reschedule it, that is okay. Almost everyone that I know has rescheduled their MCAT once or twice. And that's fine. It's better to reschedule it and wait till your score is closer to where you want it to be. If you have a lot going on personally, um, it's a bad time. You don't have the headspace for it. You feel like you can't dedicate this amount of time to studying for this right now. You can wait. You can wait to apply the next cycle and take it to the next cycle. People do this all the time and they take a gap year and this allows them the time to study for the MCAT at a better time in their personal life, as well as maybe add some other things to their application, like more clinical experience or a volunteer experience that they really wanted to do or travel. So timing is important, but timing is customizable. And don't let other people discourage you when it comes to the MCAT. The last thing that I do wanna say before moving on to the next slide um, is that the MCAT does take 30 days to release your score back to you. While it's not a crime to wait to take your MCAT later into the summer while the application opens in May, um, I would suggest that you wait no later than the end of April to take your MCAT because then your score will come back at the end of May. That will kind of guide your school list as far as where you believe you have the best chances of applying. This is what I did and it led me to more success than I think if I would have applied without my score. I think my school list would have looked a little different. And some people, they have great success applying without their score, but it is something that can be stressful and I don't recommend it. The next thing that you need to gather are your letters of recommendation. These are just as important as your scores. Um, this is people's impression of who you are as a person, as a student, as a future physician. So you want to make sure that these people know you well, that you have a positive and professional relationship with them, that they respect you, and that you believe that they will write a great letter for you. Try not to ask people that you don't know very well. Um, if you are really smart about it and you're ahead of the game, ask people right after you've had their class and then ask them to tuck that letter away for whenever you need it for medical school. I didn't do that, um, but I did keep up the relationships with professors I had as a sophomore all throughout college. So I was, I still was connected enough to them to ask them to write me that letter, even though I had a class with them a long time ago. But I do think it's a good idea to ask for a letter as soon as you've taken that class. That way their experience of you is very fresh in their mind. And um, also if you have shadowed physicians or you've worked with physicians that subscribe, I do recommend getting a physician letter. Um, one or two is really good if you can get one or two physician letters. Um, these are people who are currently working the job that you want. So their impression of you, if you think it will be a good one, could be very beneficial to your application. And finally, I want to touch on the committee letter because the committee letter is actually required by some schools. Um, so I usually recommend to students that they need to get a committee letter and just use that for all schools. It's much simpler than asking for three separate letters from different professors and then submitting them individually. It's sort of tedious and time consuming. 
a committee letter allows you to take the three letters of different professors and have a committee letter writer assemble those letters or those opinions, however they've decided to gather that information and create one narrative about you as a person and a student. And this is the best way for the committee to kind of get a very well-rounded view of who you are. It's very popular. Um, even schools that don't require it often will say on I'm sorry that they prefer it. So I would recommend going ahead and asking your, either your advisor or your uh, pre-med club leader how to get started on the committee letter. And then at the bottom here, I have some recommendations for organizing letters. This isn't something that you need to stress about. Um, this kind of came to me as I was doing it. Nobody really told me how to do it. Um, but you can ask letter writers to use the AMCAS links that AMCAS will provide them. You just like hit the button and it sends them an email and gives them a link to upload the letter because these letters, you're not allowed to read them. They need to be private. You need to not have seen them. So these links kind of allow for that. And then I used Interfolio Dossier, which there's free and paid versions. The paid version is going to be most useful. It's $50 annually for you to be able to get your letters from your professors and physicians whenever you want. It can be very early. You could do this as a sophomore. And you'll send them a link through the dossier, and then they'll upload it to that link. It'll be hidden from you so that you cannot see it. But then you can send it out to AMCAS, AACOMIS, TMDAS, whenever is the best time for you to do that when you're applying. And I found this to be a very good way to organize all of these letters. Next, we can talk about the personal statement. I love talking about the personal statement. The GPA and MCAT pique your committee's interest, but the personal statement is what holds it. So when are you supposed to start writing the personal statement? Pretty early, I would say pretty early. I think some people put this off for way too long. I would say at minimum six months before you apply. I started writing mine a year before I applied and I'm very glad that I did because I wrote at least 15 drafts and my final draft I wrote two weeks before I applied and it looked vastly different from the previous one. Writing the personal statement over a long period of time allows you um, an ample time to reflect about you as a person, the experiences that you've had and how that has led you to where you are today because you are gonna be a really different person from being a freshman to a senior or a junior in college applying to medical school. And I think that giving yourself enough time to really reflect on everything that you've done over these last four years has shaped you to where you are and who you are today. This is, essay is 5,300 characters. Again, describing why you wanna be a physician. Do not underscore this essay's importance. It is at least important as your MCAT. It is very important. This will help you get an interview. I have a general outline here. You do not have to use this. Almost everyone uses a similar outline to this. Um, I use something very similar myself. They have a story one, which is the hook story, a story that grabs your reader's attention. Second story is the planted seed that led you to consider being a physician. Story three is the affirmation that continued interest. What did you do that made you you know, continue to affirm that you wanted to be a doctor. And sometimes people will add a fourth story in there if it's a short enough one. And then your big conclusion or, you know, the neat little bow that wraps it all up and says, this is exactly why I want to be a doctor. This points back to every story that I've told you thus far. And then I have down here another big tip for you guys. I highly recommend Dr. Gray's guide to the personal statement. It's $10 on Amazon and it has tons, like hundreds of examples of personal essays that are great and not so great and what the committee's impression of them is. And it really gives you a good idea as far as what content the committee is looking for, what might be meaningful to talk about and what you might be able to do away with. More essays. Aren't you so glad there are so many essays when you apply to medical school? So there are 15 experience essays that you can fill out. You do not have to fill out all of them. I would recommend trying to get to nine or 10. I did 13 personally. These are 700 characters at a maximum, which is really short. It's actually like two to three sentences. And you're trying to make them interesting, which can be difficult um, to describe an experience using like an example with just like two sentences. Um, three of these are expanded upon with a 1,325 character paragraph. This gives you the opportunity to take an experience like you know, volunteering maybe with children and 
really expand on that and highlight maybe a specific person that affected you and impacted your desire to be a doctor, they don't have to be clinical experiences. Again, referring back to those activities that we discussed earlier, um, this can be a hobby that you really enjoy. I wrote an experience essay and a most meaningful essay about being um, working in a coffee shop as a barista and interacting with the customers there. So this can be um, about anything that you feel describes you as a person and has kind of made you who you are. So it doesn't have to always be clinical. Um, and I just put a note here, there's um, no most meaningful essays for a geo school application for AA Comus. Um, and then their 700 characters get shortened to 600 characters um, for those general little paragraphs that you write. So keep in mind, if you're applying to both platforms, you're gonna need to rework every single one of your essays for AMCAS to fit AA Comus standard. And then I have here a timeline for when you should begin. Um, I would recommend roughly about two months out. This gives you plenty of time to write drafts of all of these essays and then change your mind about them. Maybe you wanna take one out. Um, maybe you wanna change the story that you used for a certain experience. This gives you plenty of time to do that. It even gives you time for asking other people to read it for you, um, which I highly recommend having people read over experience essays and the personal statement especially somebody who has a lot of experience with grammar and English writing. Um, you know, we only have so much experience. We tend to write um, not so grammatically pretty in the sciences. So I think it's very beneficial to ask somebody else to read these for you. Um, so yeah, I say about two months out for those experience essays. Don't stress it too much about those. And then we can't talk about applying for medical school without talking about money. So here, I'm gonna show you the money. First thing you got to think about is that MCAT. That MCAT is expensive. It drains the bank for sure. So there's a $350 fee to sit for the test. And at the minimum, you're going to need AAMC official prep course materials. So that's the practice exams and um, practice question banks. That is $320. And any additional course prep can range anywhere from 300. And I have seen a course for 10,000, although I would not recommend you spend that. And you also need to account for the potential that you might have to retake the test. Um, I retook it myself and a lot of my peers that were applying to the same cycle also retook the test. Um, and then you have your application fees. So um, AMCAS is $175 for the first school, 45 for every additional school. AA Comus is essentially $200 for the first school, 55 for every additional. And here I have TMDAS um, for anybody who's interested in applying to Texas schools, it's 215 flat rate. Um, and then I have here just a little note. If you did not know, the reason that a lot of people who are not from Texas do not apply TMDAS is because 90% of their students, again, they're Texas residents and they like to keep it that way. I'm not saying that you can't do it, you totally can. Um, I just wasn't interested in moving to Texas for any reason. There wasn't a reason for me to do it. So I, I saved my money on that one. I do want to mention here another little tip. Um, it's not on the screen, so if you need to write it down, please do. But these additional course prep cl um, classes and things like that, like Princeton Review and Kaplan and Blueprint, they often do include those double AMC official prep materials that you see, that $320. So make sure when you're looking at what you want to do that you review what's included in that price for that course and don't purchase the double AMC stuff if it's included because that's $320 that you can save. So I have some asterisks here besides these exams or tests, I guess you could say. Um, I, the reason I have that there is because not every school requires these tests. Very few really, at least um, the ones that I applied to, I applied to 13, which a lot of people will apply to 20 or 25. So I'm sure that there are people who are shelling out this kind of money. Um, so CASPER is a test of medical ethics. Um, there's even courses that you can take to prepare for CASPER. Um, I found that videoing myself answering medical, medically ethical related questions and also working on my typing speed was very valuable and free. $85 is what covers eight schools, $16 for every additional school. The preview exam is a relatively new exam that tests your professional abilities. It's supposed to kind of help you as you enter medical school. This is $100. Um, I haven't seen that many schools actually ask for it. Not a single one of mine did. And then 
something you need to keep in mind is that there are secondary application fees. So you've written your personal statement and you've written your experience essays, but you are not done writing essays. There are essays that they send you as a secondary prompt in an email through a link and you will fill out probably, I would say at least 40 more essays, um, depending on if you, I mean, some people don't apply to do as many schools and they have less essays, but most people will apply to at least 10. So these range anywhere from $50 to $200. They're required by almost every school. I think only two of my schools did not require secondary essays, official ones, and they were DO schools. And I still had to send them two small essays. Um, that were through the primary application. The thing I want to mention here at the bottom of this slide is that fee assistance programs do exist through AAMC. You can fill out an application for it if they think that you might qualify. And the worst that they can do is say no. So I say do it. And if you don't qualify for fee assistance, some schools will waive the application fee if it's a really expensive one and maybe you're having a hard time affording that. And again, the worst they can do is say no. So if you um, feel like you're having a difficult time paying for all of this stuff, which is really expensive, um, please don't be afraid to reach out to them. They're usually very kind and you might be able to save some money. The last point, the eighth point on the Medical Magic 8 Ball to find out if you are ready to apply to medical school, if you are where you think you are, this is stamina. You need stamina for this entire process. You'll never not need it for becoming a doctor. This requires a lot of discipline, endurance, and you have to be prepared for, I know people say it a lot, but a marathon, not a sprint. Um, once you submit this primary application, go ahead and celebrate this victory, but don't rest for too long because it is time to start pre-writing secondary essays. What do I mean by pre-writing? What I mean is that every year, um, different free platforms will release the prompts that were sent out to students the previous cycle, and people will use these prompts to pre-write their essays. And the reason that they do this is because many schools will send you secondary essay requests all kind of at the same time, and they usually request that you have them back within two weeks. So you have 14 days to do their essays, do them well, and send them back to them. So I've had as many as two secondary essays and as many as 14 secondary essays. So depending on the number of schools that you would like to apply to, you could be doing anywhere from 30 to 70, 80 essays. That's a lot. And I would not blame anybody for being overwhelmed. And there's quite a few people who get overwhelmed and do not finish all of them um, for schools that maybe they're not as interested in or they just ran out of time and they hope for the best. But if if you can manage it, start pre-writing those secondary essays, starting with the schools that are most important to you. And then that way, most of your essays are gonna be prepared because they're recycled a lot of the time. They might have one or two new prompts, but most of those essays are gonna stay the same. This will be a great benefit to you. Future you will thank you. Down here, I have a link that you can copy and paste um, into the browser, it's perspectivedoctor.com. I used this myself, found it to be very helpful. They update it every cycle. So I just kind of want to end on a note um, of how to know when the right time is to apply. And honestly, the right time to apply is when you feel prepared because again, we're talking about self-assessment. That's the whole point of today's seminar. We're talking about assessing your application, assessing where you're at in your pre-medical journey. And part of that assessment is asking yourself if you are prepared to even go to medical school. When I was getting ready to apply as a junior, I did not feel prepared to become a medical student. And that thought scared me because everyone told me that this is when you're supposed to apply. If you want to go to school, you know, out of college, like this is when you apply, this is how you do it. And I'm really glad that I didn't allow that to deter me from doing what was best for me at the time. You know, I didn't ignore the things that were going on in my personal life. And I took a step back and decided to wait to apply when I was a senior. And that gave me time during my gap year to travel and to gain more clinical experience that also really helped my application. So the right time to apply is definitely the right time for you personally. Try not to compare so much to your other classmates. Um, I will say when you start thinking, 
you know, I want to apply this cycle, whatever that is for you. Um, there are definitely strategies for when to apply that help you the most. Applying early will greatly increase your chances of success. I've known students to apply in September, which is pretty late, and they still have success, but you will give yourself the greatest chance at not having to apply twice by applying early. So these applications, they, they open um, at the beginning of May. All of them open pretty much the second, third, fourth. They're kind of around there. It, it sometimes changes from year to year, but they open at the beginning of May and people will typically begin to submit at the end of May, beginning of June. This is going to be very helpful to you because it takes three weeks for your AMCAS application to be processed. So they don't actually really start viewing your application till mid or late June if you apply on that timeline. So that's something that's important to keep in mind is no one will even see it for three weeks when you apply. Um, so applying early is what really helps the most because a lot of candidates do not get into medical school, not because they're not qualified, but because the admissions committee has run out of seats. They have offered the amount of interviews that they intend to offer at this time, and they will do another interview wave once they, you know, have picked people from those interviews. Um, but applying early, you know, gets your application out in front of them, and that is going to be super helpful to you when you do decide to apply to medical school. Okay, guys. So I'm going to just briefly go over these packages. Um, I'm not going to describe them too much in case you guys just want to ask questions about when you might be.